The second question Crystal asks is, what does China's early and later manage, management of the outbreak reveal about the strengths and weaknesses of the Chinese political system? So um, I think that clearly um, over the last several months, China has bent the curve. Um, uh, you see that big uh, rise, which is when the Chinese basically recalibrated a bunch of cases, but so far that they really have, according to the data they've released, bent the curve. But there also seems to be issues, continuing issues with both the information China's released about its death toll and also about the number of infected. Um, for, for example, I know from, from my family members in China, for months, Chinese needed an x-ray to be declared positive for COVID-19. So basically, you had to have pneumonia before you're said to have the disease itself. Now, um, and, and we know in the United States, of course, that the range of people experiencing COVID-19 goes from basically asymptomatic to somebody who needs to get on a ventilator immediately to obviously to people who, who die. And China recently added about 1,600 asymptomatic cases to its caseload, but that's really considered a drop in the bucket to the real number of cases. Now, mathematicians and econom economists in the United States have kind of gone after the Chinese about this issue, one being uh, Derek Scissors, uh, who works for the American Enterprise Institute, who estimates that basically China could, could actually have as many as 3 million cases, um, including asymptomatic, including light cases as well. Um, and in terms of the death toll, um, it, that's an interesting point. The, in January, the Washington Post uh, Beijing correspondent was reporting information about people dying in Wuhan in relatively large numbers, either at home or while waiting for treatment near hospitals. But those deaths were not being put underneath, under the COVID-19 category. And then on uh, April 3rd, the Post estimated in Wuhan alone, 42,000 deaths, which is 16 times the number that the Chinese have acknowledged. And I think the problem with both of the numbers of terms of COVID-19 cases, but also deaths, can be traced back to what I would argue would be a systemic problem in China. So we've seen recently in New York City, I think it was just on Wednesday, that the city added 3,000, some 800 um, to its death toll because Although these people had not been tested for COVID-19, um, uh, they were presumed by the fire department and by the EMTs to have died of COVID-19. So they were added on to New York's total death toll. That difference differs from China in that in China's system, once the party demands that, in this case, the curve be bent, by God, it, the curve is going to be bent. And no province or city out, out is, is in any way empowered to tell the truth. It's kind of like when China decides that its growth, uh, growth percent, its GDP growth will be 6% in 2020, it's a state set target. And so all the provinces, even if they're not growing at 6%, basically have to announce that they're growing at 6%. And that's a systemic issue that, that China faces in terms of, of when the party dictates that this must happen, it must happen, no matter what uh, is the reality. But nonetheless, I think that um, the broad issue, the broad takeaway is that China does really seem to have bent the curve. Now, third question Crystal asks is, what do we know about how the Chinese economy is recovering now that the, with the lifting of lockdowns? And um, it's clear that China's economy is taking a big hit. The big issue is how big is this hit going to be? Um, but already before COVID-19, the Chinese economy was facing relatively significant headwinds. It was growing at its slowest pace in decades. And generally, economists agree that this quarter that China is going through is going to be, China will slip into a recession. But how long this recession is going to last, I think, is still back to the humility issue. We still just don't know. Now, China has launched the stimulus package like the United States has of about $344 billion. And in some sectors, like healthcare, Chinese companies are doing extraordinarily well. And interestingly, I think so far, China's numbers are, are, are significantly better than expected. So for March trade data, uh, the exports, uh, a group of analysts forecasted a decline about 14%. The real decline is less than 7%. And in terms of imports, the uh, forecasted decline was around 10%, but the real decline has been less than 1%. So that's like kind of a bright spot, if you will. But 
medium term, China's economy is still reliant to a certain extent on exports to fuel a significant portion of its GDP growth. And as the world slips into a global recession, that's going to hurt China significantly. I mean, about 20% of China's economy is, on, is, is reliant on the export sector. And if you lose that, that's a significantly big chunk of your economic growth. But I think another thing that's, that we should, we should pay attention to is on the economic front, when you're talking about economic reforms in China, China's government has started to make noises just in the last couple of days about relaunching market-oriented economic reforms. And it's, it's a proviso. They've made this threat to do something like this since 2012 when Xi Jinping took power. But this time, uh, my guess is that they might be serious, and that reveals something else about how China works, if you will. And the Communist Party basically turns to the market during periods of crisis. They did so after the Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989, kind of ushering in a golden era for Chinese entrepreneurs in the 1990s. And given the seriousness of the expected contraction now, my guess is they very well could do the same thing as well. China's president and party boss, Xi Jinping, is, is no friend of the market because he, like the rest of the leadership of the party, cannot tolerate a different loci of power, right? They don't want to see a wealthy elite not under the party's control, advocating for political loosening. But I guess that Xi Jinping is probably going to allow these capitalists a lot more breathing room than in the past because China needs them. And then once the economy stabilizes, he will reassert control once again. <clears throat> now, how is the party trying to reshape the narrative, both at home and abroad, to strengthen its image and soft power? And, it, and I think it's an interesting thing to sort of step back a little bit and to recall that when the virus erupted, it was hailed in, in some quarters as sort of China's Chernobyl moment, when China's systemic weaknesses would be exposed for all to see. And then once China flattened the curve, you get this other take, uh, and other people began saying, wow, China's going to take over the world. It's flattened the curve. It's, it's succeeding. And China's success in dealing with the coronavirus illustrates the superiority of China's system. Now, I think the reality is probably going to be significantly messier. And I think the party recognizes this as it tries to shape the narrative about its response. And China basically has launched this, this prop public relations campaign on steroids that have designed to do basically two things. One is to try to show China as this responsible stakeholder, as sort of the adult in the room, a grown-up power, distributing masks and, and PPE and, and ventilators around the world. And China clearly wants to differentiate itself from the U.S., which appears obsessed with, you know, America first and apportioning blame on the WHO and Wuhan. But secondly, China is also trying to muddy the waters about the source of the virus. I mean, this is um, a tweet from uh, Li Jianzhao or Zhao Lijian, who is a spokesperson for the foreign ministry of China, basically saying, you know, it might be the U.S. Army who brought the epidemic to Wuhan, which is kind of ridiculous, but the goal is not to be ridiculous. The goal is to kind of introduce doubt into the, the general narrative about where the virus came from. Uh, I think that neither goal right now is being achieved by China. Um, Chinese diplomats have been caught in various places, in Wisconsin and in Germany, lobbying in Wisconsin state senators and in Germany federal officials uh, for trying to get resolutions passed praising China. Um, China is even getting criticized for its apparent largesse. So stories about low quality face masks and PPE are coming out in the, the press in the Czech Republic, in Spain, even in Italy. And then some of the shipments which China portrayed as aid have turned out actually to be commercial deals. China's export authorities are also holding up shipments of healthcare equipment to the United States and to Europe as well. That, that's, that's happening in China. So that's kind of on the PR front. I'm not seeing really huge wins for the, for the PRC. Also, longer term, this crisis could very well accelerate trends that worry China. So European countries, including France, Germany, and Britain, and, and then also the United States and, and Japan, are reassessing their dependence on China for critical health and national security related supplies. And this reassessment is occurring against the background conversation in the West 
about whether limits should be placed on economic interdependence uh, of China. I mean, this gets into the whole argument about the wisdom of decoupling from China and its economy, which is something that the Chinese government is still very concerned about, as are a significant number of Americans as well. And this is an ongoing story, but the virus seems poised to add a dose of accelerant to the whole decoupling question with China. And in closing, uh, Crystal asked me for some thoughts comparing the American and Chinese management of the outbreak and what it means for the future of US-China cooperation or competition in world affairs. And, and I, I think that there have been some really disturbing parallels in how both nations have mishandled the virus. You know, people in both nations have resorted to nasty xenophobia and racism in dealing with, with the virus. I mean, in the States, you have this, these, these ridiculous attacks on Asian Americans, um, and which has prompted people like this woman here to basically say, I am not a virus. I see that amongst my children, even in their demographic in Berkeley, California. Um, but on China's side, you also have these very nasty cartoons about China tossing out foreign trash. Um, and these being Chinese um, medical workers who are tossing an African American, actually he's, a, he's, an, he's an African, into the, into, the, um, into the recycling bin. Both nations have also engaged in ridiculous finger pointing and both nations are clearly seeking to profit from the, the mistakes of the other. So we have Trump's decision to cut funding to the WHO, which was completely silly. Uh, and also very small-minded. The same goes for China's decision to keep on banning the small democratic nation of Taiwan from some sort of direct relationship with the WTO. So in closing, I'd like to kind of pose this question. And, you know, I mean, ever since basically I was at Stanford studying Chinese-related things, um, there was generally this idea that many Americans and then many Chinese had is that the future of the world really belong to China and the United States, either together or apart. So the together notion was that um, Beijing and Washington would, would together manage climate change, economic issues, nuclear prolif proliferation, terrorism, and, and even pandemics. China would become this rep responsible stakeholder, and the U.S. Would, would kind of make room for China at the top. And this was the world of what, what they called engagement, the world of G2, and, and, and this, this formulation of Chimerica, sort of a win-win and strategic partnerships. And the other kind of competing idea was that this was going to be a new Cold War, and one was going to win out. Um, you'd have much more competition than cooperation between Washington and Beijing, and decoupling was going to happen. But in the end, one of the, one of the countries, one of the great countries, either China or America, would win and the rest of humanity would follow in line. And, but interestingly enough, no one really wanted to wrestle with the potent possibility that neither country was actually a fit to lead the world. And I kind of think that this woeful response of both nations to the coronavirus and this, and this kind of petulant game of gotcha you see being played and played out in Washington and Beijing, it, it, it poses, gives us the opportunity to consider Another idea, and to ask a question, is it possible that neither the United States nor China is capable of world leadership? And if so, what nation or what organization could step into the breach? Um, and with that, I'll, I'll close. Um, I'll shut off my PPT if I can figure out how to do that. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. We can all do this. He can see this, ready? This is what I tell my students to do. Even when you're muted, everybody can kind of do this. And what I would like to do, actually, maybe we can make it a little interactive. See if you can go to your participant list and there's a way in uh, Zoom where you can raise a virtual hand. And that way we can bring your voices into this one at a time. So if you raise your virtual hand, does everyone see how to do that? And we can moderate some questions with him. How do we do that? So if you go to uh, participants. Uh, the menu in the bottom of your screen, click participants. Yes. And then you'll see some multicolored icons. Yes, no, go faster, raise hand. You see one that's like a, thank you for that, Paul. You're so welcome. let me see, I'm gonna first go to Mike. Go ahead, Mike.
Oops. Here we go. I think I have to unmute unmute myself. Go ahead. So, so John, uh, in in the context of your very last comments, I have a sense that the uh, Trump administration is making a serious effort to use this opportunity to redirect America's supply chains away from China. Uh, Peter Navarro was assigned to head the Defense Production Act effort. Right. Uh, And I think there, in addition to that, there's obviously uh, vulnerabilities to us at this moment to having a lot of the things we need to fight the virus coming from China. So uh, I'm just curious about your thoughts on whether we're going to be able to bring back supply chain to the shores of the United States or at least to friendlier countries. So I think that's clearly an opportunity that they all see as possible. I mean, I mean, remember very early into China's crisis, uh, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, made a statement at, at, at the floor of the, in Congress basically saying that this is going to actually help American workers, which is going to go down in history. It's one of the dumbest things anyone ever said. But nonetheless, it gives you a, a vantage point into the thinking of the administration. Um, and, there, and, and Navarro being uh, now playing an important role, and you know, uh, you have to give him his props. He was one of the few people in the administration who argued that this was going to be a serious problem for us as well. But that said, you have people like him, uh, Ross, Leitziger, who's the USTR, the trade representative, all behind the idea that we need to uh, decouple from China. And obviously, Steve Mnuchin on the other side, and Treasury, Treasury Secretary is less um, uh, forcefully uh, for that idea. So the administration is split on, on the topic, but you definitely see a significant part of the administration being really interested in using this crisis as a way to further decoupling. Uh, onshoring, I think, is, is, is a dead end. You're just not going to be able to be, bring that type of production back to the United States, but you're, you, you're already seeing it moving to other countries. And so if you look at Vietnam's exports, for example, in 2019, they grew by 50%. And they grew by 50% because a significant amount of trade came, actually went from China to Vietnam. Uh, Bangladesh's trade with the United States, Indonesia's trade, Malaysia's trade, we're all increasing as well. And so you, you're definitely going to see that push. I think the, 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 um, the line that the administration is, is giving out to American workers that these jobs are coming home is just complete Pollyanna-ish and wrong. Thank you for the great question, Mike. I see Cynthia's hand up in oh. Livermore. Cynthia, go ahead. Oh, um, I... This is the first time I've ever talked on Zoom. Um, So I was wondering, kind of along that same line of trying to onshore or spread the manufacturing, you talked about a a third way we all move forward, meaning the world. And I was just wondering, you know, rather than U.S. or China dominating or working together, I was just wondering what that might be. What are some of the, some of the ideas or kind of mechanisms that might make that a possibility? Well, I mean, that, that's a great question. And, and I was sort of throwing it out there, just looking at the woeful response of both governments and the fact that there now is increasing pushback from our partners, our allies against what we're doing. And China is not getting as much traction as it would like to have either. But if you look at some of the countries that are succeeding in dealing with this, I mean, uh, one example would be Germany. And Angela Merkel is an extraordinary leader. And she's really emerging as the leader, I mean, in, in, if, you, if you will, the de facto leader of the Western world, Western world. You also see another country that just happens to be on our northern border, Canada, doing extremely well with this. And in, interestingly enough, it's, uh, Germany is sort of the exception, but most of the countries that have done a good job against the coronavirus are countries that had a very bad experience with SARS 17, 17, 16, 17 years ago. Germany being the exception. Um, it's done a wonderful job, um, well, done a, 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 past, a, a pretty good job. But again, it's like, so do you see this sort of a new a, a transatlantic alliance with other countries joining together with the United States being not on the outs particularly, but um, significantly weakened in terms of its moral suasion? Um, that's, I think, a real possibility. Thank you, Cynthia, for the great question. How about Heather Hudson? Uh, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Yeah, just coming back to that last point 
about f the future. I mean, clearly Putin would like to see Russia play that role as the dominant power. I personally don't think that will happen, although they may come back from the lows of the um, the 90s. And as a Canadian, no, Canada's going to be an example in some things, and Merkel is retiring. But I, I guess the question I have for you about China is, I think that China, which always plays the long, thinks in the long term or acts planning for the long term, when I see the huge investment they've made in developing countries in Africa, as well as Southeast Asia and, and South Asia and Latin America and even the Caribbean, um, it has to be that that's part of some long-term strategy. It's not all just for natural resources. Um, and I keep thinking at some point they're going to call in those chips, but I wonder what your thought is on whether how China is planning to use um, all that investment, plus the, the silk, the silk route or the great silk road, right. um, which is also a huge investment designed to have a lot more economic power, I think, as well as, the other political power. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. I, I would say that um, I'm sort of, um, on, this, on this front, you, you see the, the, the great ambition of China to uh, use its capital and its technology to have, to increase its global heft. And in some cases they've been very successful, but in other cases they've, they've, they've failed miserably. Uh, China uh, was Brazil's new great partner. And now they're barely on talking terms, on speaking terms. Okay, Brazil has a nut, nutbag as a president, but, but there's, there's significant problems in terms of China's investment in Brazil. China uh, invested $60 billion plus in the, the economy of Venezuela, and it hasn't gotten China anything. Uh, and in terms of Southeast Asia, it's interesting. Yes, the Chinese have put a lot of emphasis on their relations with Southeast Asia, but it's also important to remember that the Japanese actually have invested more in Southeast Asian infrastructure than China. So, and then in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is building out you know, from Eurasia towards Europe, the Chinese are doing it in Putin's backyard. And while there is a sometimes off again, on again, love affair between Putin and Xi Jinping. Uh, the, the, the Russians very much look at the, that, that Chinese investment with, with a gimlet eye. They're worried about Chinese encroachment on what they believe to traditionally be their sphere of influence. So I don't think it's all smooth sailing. And then, it, then also, if you look at Africa, to end up in Africa, some Chinese investments have been extremely successful and it's been a win-win. You look at Chinese railroad investment in Zambia, for example, it's done extremely well. But when the Chinese get into resource extraction and the Chinese have to deal with African miners, it's been horrible. And there have been a lot of anti-Chinese riots also in Zambia and in other countries because of the woeful way that they've handled the mining sector there. So it's, you clearly have an ambitious country that wants to export its excess capacity and then, ta and, and then tack along a lot of geopolitical benefits to that as well. At the same time, as they become bigger, they start to deal with the problems that we've dealt with, is that you become a very big target. Uh, if you screw up, it can have huge ramifications and um, you can desire being on the top, being the top dog, but once you get to that position, it becomes very perilous to stay on that for very long as well. So I think, I mean, you definitely, I agree with you completely, they have the ambition, but their capabilities are, are still, in many cases, uh, difficult for them to actually realize those ambitions. Thank you, Heather, for the question. Uh, let's turn to Paul Herrerius. Paul, go ahead. Thank you, Crystal. Appreciate that. And, and thank you, John, too. Fascinating presentation. Um, on another angle, talking about uh, changes in the workplace post COVID-19, what do you anticipate will be some of the uh, changes in how workplaces will look? And how would you differentiate the new look in China versus in the United States? So actually, this is really interesting because COVID-19 is coming at a period of time in China where, as I said, there are significant economic headwinds in the economy. 
And one of the biggest uh, challenges the Chinese face medium long term is that their demographic picture is pretty ugly. They are aging much more rapidly than we are even in the United States, even though as a, as a nation we're, we're far richer than they are. Um, this in 2017 or 18, the median age of the, of the, of, in China surpassed that of the median age in the United States for the first time. Uh, from 2015 on, their workforce has begun to shrink. And so I look at COVID-19 as, as going to be adding a dose of accelerant onto China's research into automation, right? Because already um, with a shrinking workforce and the desire to have actually a higher growth rate, you really need it to, you can't, you can't just throw labor at it anymore because labor costs are going to be increasing because your labor pool is shrinking. You actually have to throw more capital to increase efficiency and productivity. And so I think this is going to prompt the Chinese to really redouble their efforts in terms of um, uh, automation uh, and, and really changing the workplace as well in their, in their manufacturing. So, um, and then on other areas in terms of research, their, their biopharma research, uh, biotech research is gonna be put on steroids because of this as well, because they're looking long-term. And AI as well. So yeah, of course. Yeah, and AI goes into automation naturally. It's a natural fit for them, yeah. yeah. Great, thank you, Paul, for your question. What about Chris Hemeter? Yeah, so my question is, to what extent do you think um, Xi and Trump are the drivers of the dynamic now? And, you know, assuming that things change here, as they always do, and, and eventually they'll, they'll change in China, do, is there a way to come back to equilibrium when leadership changes? Because right now it seems that those two personalities are the biggest drivers of the narrative between the two countries, not reality? That's a, that's a great question. And I think that, um, I mean, the, the challenge the United States is facing right now around the world, I would kind of put in the category of a leadership challenge. And that if the United States swaps out its leader, um, it's not like everything's gonna be smooth sailing, but you'll see a significant change. The challenge China faces, I think, is less a leadership issue and that it's more systemic and that the party is really singularly focused on one goal, which is staying in power. I mean, this is a society that spends more on internal defense and internal security than it does on national defense. I mean, that just gives you an idea of where the party's priorities are. It wants to stay in power. And I think that's a systemic issue. And so things that it does um, that, that allow it to continue to stay in power are not necessarily in the interest of China, the nation state. Whereas I think our challenges are, are kind of a little bit um, less significant. I mean, they're significant, but it's a leadership issue. And I really do think that if leadership changes in this country, you could see a significant change in terms of our global heft, et cetera. Um, although there are obviously long-term trend lines, which are different. But, but I think the party, I think C, from my perspective, is somewhat like Trump, um, more of a symptom of the problem in China. And I don't well, think simply swapping him out will will make things will make things a, a lot better. I think, but I do think that medium term, um, he set the country up for for confronting the necessity of some type of political change because he's declared himself president for life. And I think emerging from the coronavirus, you actually might see a pushback within the party against his total domination of the party center to a return to a more traditional type of uh, rulership system where you have collective leadership, which is something that predated him. And I think- So <clears throat> on that thread though, do you think that she is the driver of the aggressive expansionist strategy in the South China Sea and other places like that, which also is a huge part of the narrative? Because that doesn't seem to have much to do with the preservation of the party. In some ways, it puts it at more risk. Well, I think that his calculus is that it doesn't put it at risk and it actually, it, it appeals to the uh, significant percentage of China's uh, internal uh, population, which is has been kind of ginned up national, they've, 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 they've been raised on nationalist and, and nationalism and xenophobia. So I think it does from his perspective, and it's actually relatively, from the, his perspective, relatively small investment. And also, secondly, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, I think very much wants to do this for strategic reasons, not simply because they like building, uh, they like turning rocks into islands, but because they're very 
focused on maintaining the security of a second strike capability, which is carried on uh, their nuclear, arm, nuclear weapons armed submarines. And they believe that pushing the Americans out of that area, because I mean, every time the United States Navy goes on a freedom of navigation operation in the South China Sea, they always go with ships that have sonar arrays on the back of the ships. And they're not doing that to look for whales. They're doing that to look for Chinese submarines, Chinese boomers. And I think that from their perspective, maintaining a second strike capability was a hugely important part of their strategic arsenal. And I think that is an important factor in, and, and I have to make one point, final point on the South China Sea. They began the push out in the South China Sea during the second administration of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao. It, Xi Jinping didn't start all these bad things, quote unquote. It, it, it started under Hu, and it, you know, he added a dose of accelerant to it, no doubt, but these plans and this program was something that was in process before he got into power. And again, that's my point is that simply removing one guy um, could actually have some effect, but, but I think it will be limited in nature because of the systemic crisis that China ultimately is gonna face. Thank you, super interesting, thank you. Great, thank you for those insights. Um, we even got some information about South China Sea and that's always on people's minds, so that was great. How about Stuart Lum? Hi, John. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on Chris, Chris's point um, and, and sort of thinking about what might or what could be happening or, uh, in, in this next, um, you know, five, six, seven years, given the U.S.'s disengagement uh, from, from Asia and, uh, and perhaps a desire to disengage even further from China. So, so the question is, what kind of you think that there is a chance or a danger of military action by China, either in the South China Seas or in you know the Western Pacific or you know even against Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong's democracy protesters, because um, who's going to fight them? Uh, that's a that's a really really good question, and and I have to say we're talking a lot about the future, and I kind of always remember what Yogi Berra said about uh, predictions, you know. Predictions are bad, especially about the future. But um, um, to your point, um, I think that the, the target of China's military modernization has been singularly focused on denying US forces access to the Asia Pacific region. And we're the enemy, if you will. And so, and I, and I think that the time for China's action against, for example, Hong Kong. And, and so if the Chinese go into Hong Kong, um, the, the People's Liberation Army or the, the People's Armed Police go into Hong Kong, um, there's gonna be no response from the United States militarily. It's just, that's, that's just not gonna happen. The area that could be potentially a flashpoint would be Taiwan. And I think that um, ironically, Taiwan's profoundly excellent way that they've dealt with the coronavirus uh, has probably um, diminished the potential for the PLA of even uh, you know, wanting to push for an attack on Taiwan because it's done a couple of things. It's given Taiwanese society a huge amount of self-confidence that they can deal with these types of crises. I mean, this is a nation of, of like 24 some odd million people um, and they've had less than 100 dead, um, far less than 100 dead. Uh, and they did an enormously excellent job and while maintaining um, uh, all the, the, the freedoms of, a, of an open and liberal society. And so I think that Taiwan is going to emerge from this with a significant amount more of um, international support, not simply from the United States, who has been the sole torch carrier for Taiwan, but also now from even the, from the European Union, from France and from other countries, the Australians because of Taiwan's excellent work on the coronavirus and also because Taiwan has shared a lot of its PPE and its masks with countries around the world. And so I think that will put China in a very difficult position, especially because you're gonna see Taiwan society become even more confident, which I think will help in their defense. Um, there is a potential in the South China Sea for a clash between the United States and China. But I think given the situation, um, I don't think the Chinese really want to fight a war with the United States. They want to push back at the United States, but I don't think they want to fight a, fight a, fight a war with America. Um, unless 
you see, for example, the potential for real economic difficulties in China, and then a leader emerging that's, that, that wants to orient people's attention overseas in order to cover up for the mistakes of the party internally. And you know, that's a tried and true method of populists. And that could be a potential as well. Um, but I, I look at Taiwan and I see Taiwan's excellent work on this issue. And I really see the Taiwanese society becoming more self-confident, which will have a knock-on effect in terms of its uh, nat na national defense. John, I've had a couple requests. I know you're probably talking already as loud as you can, but I've been asked <laughs> if maybe um, something with the volume, it sometimes is a little bit hard to hear. But I wanted to ask, uh, Cody also had a question. Cody, do you want to unmute yourself or should I ask your question for you? Uh, I think I can do it. If, uh, if the baby starts crying, then, uh, <laughs> then never mind. Uh, but John, thank you so much for uh, joining us. This has been super interesting. I was curious, and maybe you addressed it and I, and I missed it, but how just logistically did China go about opening up, you know, it's removing the lockdown and sort of reopening its economy after the, the sort of peak of the crisis, the same question that we're dealing with here in the States now, and we hear different views and plans and phases, and a lot of it seems to depend upon massive testing and tracing and isolating. And was China able to do that at scale if so, how and what do you see as the lessons that can be learned for us? So, yeah, they did massive testing. They did a lot of tracing. They also had apps loaded forcibly. forcibly. They basically demanded people loading, loading apps on their phone that um, traced where they were if, and basically could give information about whether they were in contact with anybody who was sick. Um, this is similar in some ways to what the South Koreans have done. Uh, similar also what the Taiwanese have done in terms of very aggressive contact tracing along with a lot of testing. But um, like I said, for a while, um, the Chinese were really focused on testing people, finding people who were really sick, people who basically had pneumonia already. Um, and I think that, uh, that, that a lot of cases slipped through the cracks. Um, and in some provinces, testing was very sort of scattered. Um, you look at Yunnan province where my, my, my in-laws live, and there was very little testing in Quimming, actually. Um, uh, and, and the Yunnanese, basically, because Quimming is a, is a mile high city, say, well, the coronavirus can't live in this type of environment. So there's a little bit of that happening. Um, but then in Shanghai, the testing was extremely aggressive, even if it, and people were basically allowed out of the homes, in some cases, only twice a day, sometimes twice a week. So it, it's a varied picture across China, but the, the things we're involved in were a, a very aggressive tracing of travelers and very aggressive uh, tracing of people who were in contact with anyone who was sick. So. I also want to follow up on that because I have a lot of Chinese students and John has probably seen this too. You know, everything in China now is done through a QR code on your phone. And now wherever Chinese people go, they actually have to show their phone yeah. a QR code that's either red or green. And that red or green is not something you have control over, but it's like something built, some kind of algorithm around if, if you were close to someone who was exposed or someone in your family was exposed or something like that. And that's part of, I believe, what John's talking about in terms of the ability to trace and to stop people who might have read from going into certain zones. And I was wondering if he was gonna can talk about that because I have some students going home now, they have to prepare their QR code now before they even go home. <laughs> so I wonder if we could talk about that. Well, I mean, in, in, in terms of your students who are planning on going home, as soon as they get into China, they're gonna be quarantined for two weeks, right? They don't get to see anybody. They're directly from the airport into a hotel where they're quarantined for two weeks. And so, um, and that's the, very much the China's benefit. I mean, you had uh, a plane load of Chinese came back from Russia flying into Shanghai the other day, and 51 people on the plane tested positive for COVID-19. Um, even though the Russians basically have said there's no, you know, we have, we have the situation under control in Russia. Um, so, you know, it's a, the Russians, and, and actually interestingly enough, COVID-19, and the Russians and the Chinese, are, it's, it's caused significant amount of neuralgia on both sides. Um, but again, if you come home, if you come back to China from overseas, you're going into quarantine for two weeks immediately. It's not like you get to say hi to mom and then, and then, then you get your QR, you have to have your QR code before. If you don't, you actually will, you'll get it then. 
and then you go from from red uh, from from red to green. Sometimes there's even a yellow, um, which is some restrictions, but not all restrictions. And then the the people who are green have all the restrictions taken off. Um, but it's done uh, by AI by contract tra contact tracing, um, and it will be folded into the ultimate goal, which is to create these social security, uh, these, um, um, excuse my, uh, um, these so social um, trust is issues, which the Chinese are gonna basically give everyone a number through, through the QR code about how socially trustworthy they are as well. So it will fit into their kind of scheme to be able to track all their people um, all the time. Yeah, I was wondering about that because my students were also concerned that this QR code will just become permanent. Yeah, it's going to it's going to be part uh, probably it's going to be folded into the social credit system. You can easily yeah. imagine that happening. I could easily it's imagine. A perfect that. opportunity. Yeah. I just also thought I would share with you. So if one of my students did go home and just to tell you the sort of extreme measures. So the moment she got on the plane, she had to put on before she got on the plane, full PPE, goggles, and a mask, and she basically was not allowed to use the restroom for the entire flight. They were closed. It was like they didn't want any bodily fluids coming out of your body at all. So she had to stay like that with maybe a little bit of straw with some water, you know, for the 14 hour or whatever flight home. And then just as John said, she was immediately sequestered into this hotel room. Once she got off the plane, she was not allowed to leave that room for two weeks. They yeah. brought food to her door. Um, and you know, there was internet, there was TV. I mean, there were the comforts within this room. I saw her because we were Zooming, but she couldn't leave it. There was no circumstance under which she could leave that room. And she was forcibly tested three times yeah. before she could leave. You know, three swabs up the nose with the whole thing. So it was kind of a tough experience. And she finally, after those two weeks, was able to go home. Yeah. Uh, but my understanding too is that now in Wuhan, I have a student from Wuhan and she's been telling us about, you know, the reopening, but it is very gradual. And it's like, you know, everyone has the masks, they have these codes, there's some limited mobility, people are going back to work, school hasn't gone back. But, you know, that is the test bed for whether or not there's going to be a second peak at some point. And what do you think, John? I mean, do you think there will be greater transparency now because the government itself is so concerned about another outbreak that if we start to see cases, you know, will they, will they share that information about new cases? And things? I, I think it's, that's a great question. I really don't know the answer. I, I, I think that on one side, the government wants, and there are people within the government, especially people within the public health bureaucracies who, who believe in this, the necessity of sharing the cases. And they were actually at the forefront of sharing with the WHO in, in December, for example. Um, and then there are also people within the party system who are less interested in sharing this type of information because it reveals Chinese weakness. And so I think there's a battle between these two. And, and I think it, it, if you've seen it in the death numbers and the number of total cases, I think it's, it's clear that um, there's been some transparency, but I don't think it's been all, all the way there, um, which is important because it will impact decisions outside of China about as countries kind of come along and see how China's going. So it's really important now actually for China to be more transparent because it could become a model. And I think that there's a push and pull within the party state over, over whether to be transparent or not. And I think it's still an open question. So I don't know. I think it's probably an open question too. Do we have any last questions out there? No? Well, I just want to say thank you so much. In fact, I'm going to do something which is kind of a cool thing before we go. I want to uh, conduct a quick poll of those of you who've come today to see if you'd be interested in coming back for uh, more events now. Bear with me for a second. This is required. And while, to and while Crystal is doing that, this is Cody Harris. I'm the president this year of the Stanford Club of Moran. And I just want to thank all of you for, for doing this. John, especially, thank you for, for taking your time for us. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and to all of you, you guys were sort of guinea pigs in a new technological world, a virtual uh, event. I, I think Crystal mentioned it was our first one. And I think it was, from my perspective, it was great. I really enjoyed hearing from John. I enjoyed my, my 
breakout session and I kind of wanted more of it. Um, I hope uh, you guys feel the same. If you want to get involved with the Stanford Club of Marin, we're always looking for folks to, to do that, to get involved, to, um, to work with us, to give us your ideas for events you want to, you want to hear, from people you want to hear from. Uh, please take this poll. It should have just popped up on your screen. And, um, and uh, stay in touch with us. We have a Facebook group. You can search for it, Stanford Club of Marin on Facebook. Feel free to pop on there and chat with each other and meet each other. And, uh, you know, check your email and make sure it doesn't go into the spam filter when we send stuff out. Because if we're all going to be locked down for a while, we want to make sure that we can bring you interesting content and ways to connect and learn and, and uh, meet each other. So uh, I hope to see more of you, even if we can't see you in person. And thanks so much to Crystal for arranging this. I think uh, it took a lot of work, a lot of technical effort. So thank you to Crystal for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Well, well done, Crystal. Well, actually, I wanted to say, Cody, Cody, I think you should take a, um, you could take a virtual screenshot. This is like our event. So everybody, <laughs> smile yeah, everyone Cody. smile. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> he's our, he's our uh, designated photo taker of our events. But I want to say, too, thank you so much, John. We learned so much every time. This is the third time I've heard John speak. Uh, in the last few months and I learned something new every single time. So thank you so much. And I wanted to reiterate that um, if you want to get an autographed copy of John's book, I put his email in the chat. And if you can't see that in the chat, you are welcome to uh, also email me and I can tell you uh, what his email is, but he can remind us it is pomfret, let me see. It's pomfretjohn at gmail. Okay, yeah, it's a great book. I think it's really fun. I think a lot of you will enjoy it too because it's this parallel look at American and Chinese history together. And as someone who's a comparative political scientist myself, those are my favorite types of books which are comparative in nature. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. And let me see, let's share our poll. This is the cool thing about, oh, look at this. This is fun. Cody will enjoy this. Everyone said yes, Cody. <laughs> so that sounds great. It Victory. seems the Communist, the Communist Party of China was behind this. <laughs> yes. How many respondents? Exactly. I was just going to say, too, that, you know, it seems like from my following of the situation, uh, our social distancing and sheltering in place will be going on for a while longer. So anyway, look for a note from us. I also really enjoyed our happy hour breakout conversations. And maybe next time we can just have a happy hour thing and we can have sort of like multiple breakout sessions. Although I'm going to heed Paul's cautionary tale of, you know, breakout sessions, which lead to the same people. So I'm gonna have to see how that works. But I really thought that was a lot of fun. And I thought, you know, the breakout sessions give us a chance to talk to each other. Sometimes in our in-person events, there's not even as much opportunity um, to chat. So I thought that was, that was really great. And any other ideas you have or um, thoughts about ways in which we could hold a virtual event, you guys have my email now and feel free to reach out and share those ideas with us. So be safe and well, and we will hopefully see all of you soon. Thank you. Thanks Take again. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Thank John. You. Thank you. Cody, great job. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Crystal. Great job. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a great night.